As many of you know, I am a massive Pokemon fan and always have been. I've been playing the game since the North American series debut in 1998 and have played every single mainline game since. That said, like many, my reason for doing so seems to be quite different or at the very least more nuanced than the reason Pokemon Company seems to think. Let's talk about it. Quick note before I get started, if you enjoy this video and the channel in general, do me a favor and leave a like and comment to let the YouTube algorithm gods know that you enjoy the content we make here. I wish people could just watch the videos and enjoy our content without having to comment if they don't necessarily want to, but unfortunately our YouTube overlords demand comments, likes, and shares, so if you don't mind, please do us this favor on this video and hopefully our future videos if you choose to continue to watch us. Okay, on to the video. First of all, I want to say this video wasn't brought about by any kind of disappointment surrounding Pokemon Sword and Shield or even the recent expansion pass information dump. I loved Pokemon Sword and Shield and I think the content we've seen from Isle of Armor and Crown Tundra look to double down on all of the things I think those games did well, particularly in the battle department. That said, I think Game Freak's vision for the game seemed to be at odds with Pokemon as a brand overall. And if we're being honest, it has been for a long time now. When creating the original Pokemon Red and Pokemon Green games for the Japanese market back in the early to mid 90s, it's clear that Game Freak's eyes were a lot bigger than their stomachs when it comes to the ambitions they had for Pokemon. Just as the product of being created during the era limited to what was possible, even if they chose to move development to the Super Nintendo at the time. So it's easy to understand the the fact that Game Freak needing to sell the Pokemon world on the Game Boy, no less, sacrifices needed to be made. As we all know, these games succeeded in spite of, and in some cases because of, those very same limitations. And just as any company would do in their situation, Game Freak doubled down on what worked well that last time and continues to do a version of that with each new release to this day. They fell into a few traps by doing this that I want to touch on in this video. But let's start off with the mistake that I feel most directly affects players today. They did a poor job at communicating what really was their vision and what was their compromise. Of course, no creative is going to want to advertise where they cut corners, but in this case, a lot of the decisions Game Freak made in the interest of cost saving, time saving, and honestly, what was possible with the hardware they had at their disposal ended up becoming beloved staples of the series for a section of the Pokemon audience. That ended up handing and continues to hamper progress. Game Freak is in the position that many creators behind massive media franchises face. What truly is a core tenet of a franchise and what is solely a byproduct of limitations of the time a given release was developed in. Every new release, Game Freak's job is to decide what fits where. In other words, what can't be changed ever, what can be changed now, and what should be changed in the future when technology and bandwidth allow. Game Freak seems to have a approach Pokemon games like this to some degree, but for the most part, their progress has been made at a glacial pace. Let's try adding some perspective. Pokemon isn't alone in this after all. The Zelda franchise is the example that I'm sure most will point to, and in a lot of ways is the reason for this newfound dissatisfaction with the Pokemon franchise amongst fans. The Zelda franchise essentially implemented real changes to their formula every 15 years or so. For a while, every game was a new take on the formula seen in the original NES Legend of Zelda game that released in 1986. Then, in 1998, Legend of Zelda made a lot of sweeping changes with the release of Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. That new formula was then rinsed and repeated with each release until Nintendo started to show interest in yet another long overdue revamp. For a brief period of time, they began to inch toward it with small changes in games like A Link Between Worlds and Triforce Heroes until finally Breath of the Wild was released in 2017. For 
context, Pokemon is a 24-year-old brand and arguably hasn't seen even their Ocarina of Time moment from the perspective of non-competitive fans. To be fair though, from a competitive standpoint, it can be argued that Gen 4 was that moment as it essentially invented the competitive scene, but I digress. I say all of that to say, in reality, Game Freak's pace isn't necessarily all that bad if we compare it with a franchise like Zelda. If we're just looking at their trajectory on paper, that is. That said, that's more theory than it is anything else, and when it comes to a consumer product, public perception matters a hell of a lot more. That perception is that Game Freak has built up a massively successful entertainment brand, the most valuable one in the world, in fact. Zelda, on the other hand, while successful, is a much, much smaller brand than Pokemon is, and in the minds of many, that gap in historical success should be put to use in an attempt to expedite the evolution of their IP. This take ends up being a double-edged sword in my opinion though. Primarily because Pokemon has become much more than the games at this point. Pokemon is a multi-billion dollar cross-media juggernaut, and with that expansion into TV, film, literature, toys, apparel, so on and so forth, comes more fans that all fall in love with slightly different takes on the same universe. I personally love Pokemon for its lore, character designs, and the way the world is depicted in almost every other iteration of the property outside of the core RPG franchise. In these interpretations, the Pokemon world is a lively frenetic one. In the games, it's a lot more static, and to an extent, as I touched on, that's by design. With this foray into other segments of media came a lot of these other verticals overtaking the core Pokemon RPGs commercially. If the logic is solely that Pokemon companies should reinvest in what makes them the most money, many Pokemon RPG fans would be disappointed to see that the things they'd end up reinvesting in would be their apparel, toys, and honestly, Pokemon Go. I've said it before, for, but it bears repeating that the core Pokemon titles only account for about 20% of Pokemon Company's revenue, so using commercial success as a linchpin to an argument for sweeping changes hurts more than it helps here. That said, I think the real thing that'll get Game Freak to want to change is a desire to want to turn Pokemon games into prestige pieces. Not because they're guaranteed to sell well, but because releasing games that many will view as Game of the Year level releases on a consistent basis will elevate the brand in the long run. Game Freak haven't developed a game that I would say made a strong argument for Game of the Year since Gold and Silver, and I don't see them doing it anytime soon unless they make some difficult changes to their process. The success of the Pokemon brand in tandem with the choices Game Freak made along the way in an effort to continue to kindle the flame they ignited led them to this problem, albeit unintentionally, I'm sure. Every product has deadlines, and with deadlines comes prioritizing certain things over other things. In the case of Pokemon, it seems they chose to prioritize what differentiates it the most at a glance. Pokemon games have always been a special case. It's a Japanese role-playing game series with a major focus on competitive play. While they've also arguably put a noticeable amount of effort in an attempt to improve things like the game's presentation, characters, and lore for a better solo campaign with every new release, their path to improving on each release always has been much more about the direct share experience you have with other people than it is about the singular experience you have when playing through these campaigns. It's the only RPG in existence, at least to my knowledge, where a popular sentiment is that the point of the core Pokemon games isn't the narrative, and I'm inclined to agree with this opinion. The games are designed in a way that most other competitive single player campaigns are, to function as a means to an end. What I mean by that is the campaigns are structured in a way that the average player should be able to learn the lay of the land which in this case includes building a team of Pokemon, figuring out weaknesses, developing basic strategies, and discovering useful held items for more battle strategies. For people to want to learn all of this, the campaigns need to be enjoyable, and I would say more often than not, if not every time, they succeed in at least achieving that much. So much so that people fell in love with what for all intents and purposes was meant to be an appetizer for the entree on offer for the lack of a better analogy. This 
this is a blessing and a curse for Game Freak. It means that even with their minimal efforts in this area, they were able to build up a segment of their audience off of it. But it also means that if they hope to satisfy this portion of their audience moving forward, they should probably start to prioritize them just as much. And it's not even just the people that have fell in love with the world of Pokemon from their time with the games, but also, like I mentioned, the Pokemon anime, manga, and even card game gives everyone different expectations for what their focus should be when they jump into the games eventually. To be honest, Pokemon has become too big to serve all masters in a single product release, especially a single product that sees several iterations per console generation. The way I see it, if their aim is to push past the status quo, they either need Pokemon games to become like Smash Bros or more accurately Grand Theft Auto style releases where they're an all hands on deck once in a generation sort of deal. This is the best case scenario for most fans I think. A new Pokemon game that would release every five years or so with as little compromise as humanly possible in that window. And if they wanted to maintain their bottom line at a similar degree to what they are doing now, they could continue to support this one per generation release with continuous expansion passes when time and bandwidth allows. Alternatively, if their interest is to maintain their corporate structure that's currently in place, a corporate structure that factors in game releases into where the rest of the product lines go next, they would need to divvy up their efforts even more than they are while simultaneously dramatically improving other aspects of the game. I say this because the other decision Game Freak made at the onset of the Pokemon franchise that is shooting them in the foot today is the cadence they set for new Pokemon being introduced into the world and the expectation that every other Pokemon will be supported in the same world. Even if they still use the original pixel art style, they'd still be ballooning the effort required with every new release. All of these Pokemon means that Game Freak would need to create hundreds of unique sets of animation. No animation studio on Earth is able to make a Breath of the Wild level experience with hundreds of unique creatures and human characters to boot. Certainly not in two to three years like a lot of fans seem to be expecting Game Freak to do at least. Just look at Breath of the Wild for proof here. There are like maybe 50 unique enemy models, including bosses in each iteration of henchmen types, and that game was in development for nearly six years. To expect Game Freak to fully realize 1,000 unique Pokemon models and add in humans on top of that, you're getting a bit unrealistic here. So okay, let's say that they go ahead and limit a specific region's Pokedex for the next Pokemon release. Narratively, it's not really a hard sell to explain why specific Pokemon don't appear in a specific region. Not every continent in all our world is home to every animal on the planet. So why should Pokemon be expected to create a world where that's their reality? That said, they are still releasing a real world product with gamer expectations, so they're going to need to provide enough value to convince people that including less Pokemon can somehow lead to better games, and not just competitively like they did with Pokemon Sword and Shield. Maybe in this scenario, Game Freak still releases games less often than what is the norm now, like instead of one new mainline game every year or two, how about doing one new mainline game every two to three years? And use that extra time to flesh out all of the narrative and single player focused aspects of the next game. After having already released their first foray into full on HD development, the hope is they can spend less time learning and more time executing. And honestly, they could use Pokemon Home as an easier way to have their cake and eat it too by allowing players to still use all of the Pokemon they've accumulated over the years regardless of if they're supported in the latest game or not, albeit in not as cinematic a form as the games may afford. Think Pokemon Showdown but like official. This will allow competitive players to still use every Pokemon, it can support multiple metas in the same way that Pokemon Showdown does, and then Game Freak will be freed up to add more to the narrative side and make that part of the Pokemon fanbase happier. Honestly, I can go on and on about this, but the long and short of it is Pokemon is too big for its own good. They need to either embrace that size and give games enough time to really do it justice and give us major game of the year level experience once per generation, or give us the same frequent releases with more of a focus on what couldn't be achieved outside of a mainline game, the narrative, the world building, and single player gameplay. And I'd love to get more specific on my ideas for gameplay and all that stuff, but I've talked ad nauseum about specific gameplay ideas in other videos I don't have time to double down on here. This 
video is probably already too long. But if you'd like to hear more of my thoughts on that specifically, feel free to check out our Pokemon video playlist and be sure to subscribe for more Pokemon videos in the future while I'll be sure to continue to update my never ending list of Pokemon hopes and dreams. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, feel free to give that like button a click, share it with a friend, maybe even your favorite Pokemon blogs and fan pages, and ring the bell to be notified when new videos like it are uploaded. This week was a special case for obvious reasons for our upload schedule. Check my Twitter for more on that if you want to hear my thoughts. But we'll be back to posting every Tuesday and Thursday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. See you next week.